Hello and welcome to today's webinar on the Early Vermont Settlers to 1784 Study Project. My name is Ginevra Morse. I'm the Director of Education and Online Programs here at New England Historic Genealogical Society. I will be moderating today's event. NEHGS is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history and are pleased to offer this webinar today for our members and friends around the world. Our presenter today is Scott Andrew Bartley, a genealogist, archivist, librarian, and editor specializing in Vermont Mayflower lineages and colonial New England. He was formerly the manuscripts curator at New England Historic Genealogical Society and later the librarian slash archivist for the Massachusetts Society of Mayflower Descendants and editor of their journal, Mayflower Descendant. For 10 years, he edited Vermont Genealogy, the journal of the Genealogical Society of Vermont and was a wiki content specialist for FamilySearch.org, creating research guides on Massachusetts, her counties and Boston. He was the editor of The Descendants of Elder William Brewster, Part 1, A Silver Book. Drew is currently the lead genealogist for the Early Vermont Settlers to 1784 Study Project and consulting editor for the New England Historical and Genealogical Register. He is slowly researching and writing a genealogy of the descendants of George Lamphere of Westerly, Rhode Island, with several articles in the pipeline. So in the mid 18th century, Vermont saw a huge influx of settlers. Some would stay for generations while many others left by the early 1800s, continuing westward through New York, Ohio, Michigan, and beyond. Because of this transient population and constant border disputes with neighboring states, early Vermont can be a difficult area to research. The Early Vermont Settlers to 1784 Study Project, led by Drew Bartley, is the first project of its kind to create family sketches by head of household. Today, you'll learn more about this ongoing project, what it is, what sources are used in its compilation, how to access the materials online and in print, and what the future holds for the project. Drew will also discuss some jurisdiction issues and considerations affecting early Vermont research. At any time during the presentation, please feel free to write a question in the panel to the right of your screen. Our presenter will answer as many questions as he can in the time provided. There is no handout for today's presentation, but we are recording this event. And starting tomorrow, you can easily go back and review any of the content from the presentation on our website. And uh, so with that, and without further ado, I will turn things over to Drew. Thank you, Ginevra, and thank you for the opportunity to talk about the Early Vermont Settlers Project. I've been researching in Vermont personally since about 1971 and professionally since 1984. And even with that amount of time, there's still things to be learned. With this project, I have found new record sources that I wasn't aware of before, and other situations that are unique to a specific town. So you never stop learning. And hopefully I can give you some of that insight when we get started through this. So let's begin. So migration is an important factor in dealing with early Vermont research. It defines how we do research on people because it depends where they're coming from and where they're going as to what routes they might have gone through and also what kind of records they may have left. And this is just a brief overview of the most important features of migration. What you have in front here are the key elements and it starts with the Mass Bay Colony building a fort at Fort Dummer in 1724. Now you have the soldiers there, you really don't, and I believe you have some people sit, uh, living around the fort, but other than that you don't have too much going on before then. So there's no real permanent settlements beyond 
the fort and neighboring areas. By the 1750s, the first, I should say, the first town chartered in what is now known as Vermont is Bennington, and it was chartered in 1749. Settlements begin in the 1750s, in the beginning of the decade, and then start getting curtailed a little bit with the start of the French and Indian War, which started in 1756 and ended officially in 1763. In 1759, a military road was built from the fort at number four, which is in Charlestown, New Hampshire, on the border, going diagonally across the state and going up to the Crown Point Fort. And this was done again, as I said, in 1759. And that starts the resurgence of settlers moving in. There was a population boom starting in the 1760s, curtailed a little bit by conflicts, then starts again in earnest after the revolution and peaks around 1820. During this time, it was considered to be the fastest growing area in New England and realized that it was a frontier area at this time. But as many of you who have been to Vermont know, it's fairly rocky and not that flat. So when land started opening up in the 1780s and early 1790s in New York and parts west, people started migrating out almost as fast as they came in. What happens is that it leaves an interesting uh, scenario in Vermont where the peak population for probably 90% of the towns in Vermont happened around 1820, meaning they had more people then than they have today. So that's kind of a curious after effect of this. So realizing that many people moved out as fast as they came in. So the idea for this study project came from a thesis by Don Smith, which is a topic that we'll talk about a little bit later. So the project hopes to identify all the early settlers up to 1784. We started this project in the beginning of 2015 and have been producing roughly 120 sketches per year. All of the sketches go up online at AmericanAncestors.org and we'll tell you more about how to access that material. Since we are doing this geographically, we, when we finish a particular area, we pull this material together and there's an example of the first volume on your right and we'll talk about more of that later. The project is so big that we decided to split it into two series. The first series, of which we're focused on now, is covering all of Vermont for those settlers who arrived up to 1771. And there's a reason behind that that we'll go into later. The second series will revisit all of Vermont geographically and try to catch in all the people from 1772 to 1774. There are about 354 sketches finished to date and then uh, we have stopped for a moment as we are formulating and, and getting ready for the next volume. So the goals of this project are to provide a scholarly sketch of everyone who was there in this time period. And by scholarly, I mean we do basic research on the major sources of information. And there's a footnote for everything that we say. So if somebody is going to go do more research, they have that as a starting point. As I mentioned, when we finish a geographic area and we produce a book, 
what we do with a book is with it we also create maps of each of the towns that we're covering a short history of that town for that time period that's unique to that town and then provide an analysis of what we see in the patterns with all the early settlers for that town so with this we hope to develop more defined patterns of migration and how the towns were actually settled what the principles were and how they did that we also hope that we will uncover the interconnectivity and we're already seeing that between the settlers so most of us think of a nuclear family which is you know mom pop and the kids dog and a cat and a white picket fence but back in time there was more of an extended family you had multi-generations you had uh, siblings living together and, and dual families like that and oftentimes they're moving together and this uh, project is finding more and more of the interconnectivity between the earliest settlers they might be second cousins or even further but they tend to be related we will also have a better understanding of how religion and the politics of the people who first settled created the framework for each of the towns each of these sketches is not supposed to be the absolute end of all research of these people it's just a beginning it's a framework with a with a core minimum of material that's being covered and we hope this to be a starting point so this kind of study is actually called prospectography which is a mouthful there and what that means is it's a historical study of a group and you look at absolutely everybody who's moving at the same time and through this you find the patterns of relationships which we alluded to earlier you also find out how different groups react and what activities they do and what this also helps and is proven in this project already is for those people who are in this group or seem to be associated with the group and seem to leave literally no records you have very strong clues as to where they come from and in several cases for this project already we use those and found the people uh, in southern New England towns and if we didn't study the entire group we wouldn't have found that this is a 1784 map of Vermont and I'm using this to show how we're moving geographically with the sketches so we started with my hometown which is to the right of the red arrow which is sadly not named in here it is the town of Springfield that is the corner of Windsor County and we are slowly moving up the county until we finish the county which ends up in this tier now this is Windsor County from there we will go back south to Rockingham which is in Windham County present Windham County today and the reason why we're doing this is these two counties themselves constituted the old New York County of Cumberland County so we're staying within the same county and then after that we will move northwards above Windsor County into these towns up here and finish the eastern side and the reason why we're doing that is that there is a census that exists for that time period so as I mentioned earlier the basis for this project initially was a thesis by Donald Allen Smith the title page that you see here called legacy of descent and what he did here is he identified roughly 2,500 settlers who came to Vermont in the period from 1749 to 1784 and 
you might recognize the 1784 date. That's why we are cutting off at that date, because we were using his material. This thesis, should you want to read it, which is over, I think, a thousand pages, is in the library at NEHGS. So if you come in to visit, you can uh, see the dissertation. So while he was doing his research, Don Smith created these index cards, which you see in front of you here, in very cryptic terms. We have scanned all these cards, and these cards will eventually be a database on AmericanAncestors.org. With it will be an explanation of all of these codes. Some of these, such as this one here, is date of birth, place of birth, this is immigration, date of death, age at death, etc. Some of these you can figure out for yourself. Some of them are very cryptic. But a guide to that will accompany this. You can see on the slide here that we have roughly 22,000 index cards. And the reason why we weren't using these after the initial start of this project is the cards themselves, the alphabetical listings of these cards, are in 50 subgroups. These subgroups were groups that he was identifying as important groups to be investigated as to the reason why people were moving to Vermont and how they were shaping Vermont. So because I couldn't use the thesis right away, we will be using those cards later this year when they go up online, and that the project was a little too big in one solid chunk of all those up to 1784, we needed a dividing point, a starting point where we would break it into two series. And that comes from the 1771 census, which was taken by New York. The only parts which survive in the original that I have found is for Cumberland County. The listing of the names for the county just north of it, which is Gloucester County, has been published in the 1850s. So we have the names with that. And as you can see here in this example, these are just two particular towns, Newfane and Springfield. And as you can see, Newfane is just a list of names, even though it, there are very detailed instructions on how this census was supposed to be created. The one below is they wrote it out. So it says Sam or Samuel Douglas, and then his wife, so we know he's married, and then they have one male child above age 16. So that gives you much more detail, and it varies widely from town to town. So this was recently created into a database. We have the original images like I showed you, and it's been indexed here, and this is the index uh, entry point for it. There are more than 750 people that are mentioned in this database. I should may mention that on location, the locations that are used in this database are the current names that we use today for these towns, not necessarily the names that they used in the 1771 census. A whole bunch of towns that were enumerated then have actually changed their name. So the contents of a sketch, as I had alluded to er earlier, has a basic minimum material that's going to be covered. Vital records obviously create the framework, the births, marriages, and deaths, when we can find them, of the subject of the sketch, all spouses of the sketch, and their other spouses, if they were married as well, and including the children of the main subject of the sketch, 
and the children's spouses. The, the subjects of the sketches, we will check for their probates for absolutely everybody, and occasionally we look for the children's probates when we are lacking information. I should say from volume one, I did some statistics to determine that just under 40% of the subjects in the sketch left probates. Of that, there were 17% that were will, so the just under 40%, most of them were administrations. We check for all deeds, town meetings, proprietors meetings, and any other records that we can find before 1771 because there's so little there, I thought it was important that we include it and we include all those records. After that point, we just include some of these types of records when they give us some valuable insight into the person. After that, we try to pull together biographical information that we can get from town histories, the state papers of Vermont, of New Hampshire, or wherever they were. Military records and pensions provide great information as well. So this is an example of one sketch that is online and has also been published. This one happens to be six pages long and I wanted to show you something on each of the pages that I find of use. So every sketch starts with a person and then as you see the red arrow appear, also for all the main people in the sketches we try to create a uh, ancestry back to the immigrant if possible. This material, as you see from footnote number one, is coming from secondary sources. We don't try to do primary sources for all of it. So there is the chance that some of that might be incorrect, but we find this will be useful for people to help identify these people when they research more. As you see, Israel's wife Elizabeth was married a second time. She married Steele Smith, and we don't have an exact date that she married. The interesting thing is this appears literally everywhere in every book on this family, but there was never any proof that she actually married, uh, uh, that the woman Elizabeth who was Israel's widow was the Elizabeth who married Steele Smith. Now how that came to be proven is when we followed Elizabeth, the wife of Steele Smith, we found her obituary. Instead of using vile records, so we look at footnote 6 and you notice that we used newspapers. That's another new source that's coming online that we use heavily here. And it says that she was the relic of Captain Stephen, uh, Steele Smith and mother of Z. Curtis. Well, right there, that raises issues. It doesn't say who Z. Curtis is. I happen to know who he is because he's a famous person. So I looked at other, pro uh, other accounts of her death. And if you notice at the end, we see that it says she is also the mother of General Zabina Curtis. So that is your connection because we know that Zabina Curtis was the son of Israel Curtis. So in a roundabout way, it was that that proved that Elizabeth, widow of Israel, was the wife of Steele Smith. So you notice also that this treats other spouses. So we mentioned that Elizabeth was married a second time and we follow that person and then on page two you see that we realize that Steele was married first as well and we try to cover that and the reason being that these families are this is the beyond nuclear family that we were talking about and where relationships we are finding are coming in so now 
let's continue to page three and four. And that shows you that the biographical material that we are presenting afterwards, the meat on the bones, as I like to call it, is presented in chronological order, just as it would have happened to them in their life. We try to do probates wherever possible. And on page four, you'll see here's the probate for Israel Curtis, then living in Hanover, New Hampshire. And this material is coming from stuff that we had viewed the original material online in a digitized form. The other thing that we're doing here that's relatively new in genealogy is if you look at footnote 40, and this cites the original source and then gives you a direct URL to the actual page we were looking at that's defining the material we're giving in the sketch. Now, when you do these and, and you want to look at them yourself, the space to go, to go to the next line is not a space. It is one continuous thing. So ancestry all the way to 227 would be one solid uh, URL with no blank spaces. So the next page will show us the end of the sketch where we put the children. And as you notice here, it says possible children. So we don't always have birth records or, or things that we can necessarily prove all the children. So when that's the case, we say possible. You note here that there are question marks on these two children. And we believe they are very likely Israel's children. And we believe that by their proximity. They were in the same town. This is the only Curtis family around. And probability is that they are part of this family. And so we present them here. Occasionally, we have other things we would like to tell you that are not part of the sketch. And that's in the notes you see on page six here. And it lets you know that you can find more material in these locations. We saw it. We just didn't need to use it here. The one unique thing with this sketch is back on page five. Right here, it says that there's more details on Steel Smith in another sketch. He has his own sketch. Normally, we would have, following Israel's kids here, we would have Steel Smith's and, and his wife, Elizabeth, the widow of Israel's kids afterwards, because it is a blended family, and there's a lot of interaction we find with them, and we want that here. We didn't do this in this one case, because Steel Smith has a lot of kids, as you can see here. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight kids. And that would create a lot of duplication, so we didn't put it here. But normally on the other sketches, you would see that. So Ginevra had mentioned this before. Jurisdictions are very important. They play a key role in locating where the records are that you will need to identify these people. And that's what I hope to give you a summary here just to help guide you with that. These are the periods and who was legally the authority of the area, what we now call Vermont. As you see, there are five periods and Obviously, there are records in all of these different states, along with records being generated and that were left in what is now Vermont at the same time. So you need to be wary of that. And we will go through each one of these in detail. So this is a map in 1737 that is part of a dispute that's going on between Massachusetts Bay and New Hampshire as to what their border was. So initially, Massachusetts 
was determining where the arrow is you see on the coast is three miles up from the coast and following the river was supposed to be the Massachusetts border. And the river shown here is the Merrimack. So you see it just goes north. In practice, they did not use that. New Hampshire did settle beyond the Merrimack River and instead they started back at the mouth of the river, the three miles up, and use this line as their guide. And as you can see, it's going up at an angle. If you carry this forward over to Vermont, it will include the first one-third of Vermont in the south. And thus why um, it was Massachusetts Bay that put or built Fort Dummer near Brattleboro in 1724. So one of the other ideas was this running red line that you see here. And they did not do that. What ended up being settled is starting back of the mouth, following the river to its lowest point down here, and then from that lowest point paralleling the red line above and going straight across. That is the line that ultimately was settled on in 1741, thus making present-day Vermont completely out of the jurisdiction of Massachusetts Bay. So this next slide you see on the right, I'll show you where we were before. There's the three mile up, down to the lowest point, and then straight across. So this is a map in 1761 in the beginning of the year showing the towns settled in the province of New Hampshire. You will notice that the oldest what are called New Hampshire grants. New Hampshire grants was the area now in Vermont. And over here on the west, we have Bennington. That was the very first town they chartered. Interestingly, they didn't put it here in the corner like you would think, but they definitely set a boundary letting New York know that they thought that that's where their border was. I should say that the charter with New Hampshire wasn't very clear as to where it ended. And New York's was vague, but it was obvious where you see this line here coming up from Connecticut through Massachusetts is a logical thing. So New Hampshire seemed like a logical uh, entity to control this area. So New York protested, and um, in 1764, the king decided in New York's favor and gave the jurisdiction of what is now Vermont to New York. This map of New York in 1778 gives a view showing Vermont part of New York. As you can see here, this is the western border of present day Vermont. And when it was first established all of what is now Vermont was Albany County which you can see the name right here going up and Albany is actually right over here then they created the counties you see Cumberland County here in the east Gloucester County that I had mentioned before in the north the break is roughly right about there and then the this western portion was all Al Albany County in 1772 they created Charlotte County, which is now present-day Washington County, and that's where those records will reside. So the interesting thing with this is it gives Vermont a different setup governmentally than what it had before under the New Hampshire grants. Also, New York is more of a feudal system type where you have manors, you have large chunks of land, besides having towns, and it was a whole different concept. So that in itself started a, a definite disagreement between those who had settled, who are mainly from southern New England, 
in disagreement with New York who's trying to impose their life and their structure and their government on that area. Vermont declares itself an independent country in 1777. Not everybody knows that. However, though it was an independent country, it starts acting just as if it was another state, though it was independent of the United States at that time. This map shows the Connecticut River here, as it is today, is the present eastern boundary with New Hampshire. The boundary on the west with New York is where it is today as well. This map shows how the settlements were along the edges. The mountains are in the center, though this map doesn't detail them well in the south here. This is all mountains through here, and these towns were settled last. So this time period is creating a new set of records. Even though occasionally you get some people following the old system and recording in New York, and even occasionally in New Hampshire, so you need to be wary of that. But in 1777 to 1791, Vermont was an independent country. It fought in the American Revolution, and it, saw, and it fought on the side of the Americans, although it was playing along with the Brits as well during this period, so they kept their hopes alive in several directions. But in 1791, after appeasing some of the objections of New York, Vermont is admitted as the 14th state. This map in 1795 shows more of the counties the way they are today. And you see the center of the state is mostly filled up at this time with towns. And that's the way it is today. There are several towns that actually have no population whatsoever, but at one time, in up to 1820, they did have people there, and they did have a government, and there are records for those periods. So now we want to go and talk about how you access the material created by this project and how you can see some of the material yourself. This is the front page, the landing page of AmericanAncestors.org. We have highlighted here, as you can see, the advanced search, but I also want to bring your attention to down below here where it says Early Vermont Settlers Project, which is the project landing page. We will talk more about that later, but if you click on the advanced search, you get this search page. What has already happened here is where it says database halfway down, this arrow was pushed and was selected the Early Vermont Settlers Project. So everything you check here once Early Vermont Settlers is selected will be only index records that are found in this collection. And for this example, you can see we put in John Grout. So when you hit search, this is the result. And as you can see up here in the upper left, there are 40 matching records. This just gives you a screenshot and gives you three, and they're all John Grout as they should be. What I want to point out here is it's showing you the sketch, which is the volume. It's John Grout of Windsor. Then it lets you from this page, download directly the PDF, which is the entire sketch of John Grout. Or if you just want to view in the browser the actual page, you click here. And clicking here will give us our next example. So you click View Image, and you get this intermediate page. Now, again, you get the choice of downloading the entire PDF here with this link, where it says View here. If you click that, you will see this first page, because that's the page that index reference was. 
Also what you find here is the citation and this is the citation to the beginning of this page with an exact URL and this isn't the full in this screenshot but there is a full description of this database itself. If you click on view up pops the very first page of this sketch. So this is viewing each individual page in a browser for this project. What I want to point out is that you can move between the pages. Up here you see it's page one, you hit the arrows right and left, and you move through the total of three pages for this sketch. Most, page, most sketches are three or four pages. The most I have seen so far is seven. You can print this page with this button. Again, you can download the entire PDF. So you can do all of that. Now, if you go to this point here, see the little arrow? If you click on that, you get our next screen. And what happens is it creates, or I should say, it pulls down a menu. And this menu is all the sketches for this project that are currently online and are in alphabetical order by the surname. So what you get is the entire uh, database. You can go directly to the exact one if you want to go see a second one. Now, as I mentioned in the first part, where you hit the um, link for the landing page of the project itself will bring you here. Now, there are two links you see. So this first one that says current sketches now, if you were to click that, what would happen is you would go to the search screen that I already showed you, but instead of having to fill in the database with early Vermont settlers, it will already be filled in there for you automatically by using that link. Now if you go and choose this link that says view a list of sketches, what happens there is it pulls up your browser and it brings you to the first page of the first sketch. And that first sketch is, it's in alphabetical order, so it is currently Benjamin Allen of Wethersfield. From there, you can always pull down, as I showed you, the volume, which is the names of the different sketches, to select any specific sketch you want. So for those who are interested in having a hard copy, this is uh, the first volume that is available. And this is how you would order it. You'd go to shop and you would find this title. This book, as I mentioned, has maps, brief history of the towns, analysis of the towns. And as you can see here, it has 137 sketches in this volume. The towns that are covered are listed here, Andover, Chester, Springfield, Wethersfield, and Windsor, and those are the southern tier towns that were settled by 1771. Volume two is being worked on, and hopefully we will have that by the end of the year, and that will cover the towns just north of there in Windsor County, and will complete the county. All right, thank you, Drew, for your presentation. So now let's tackle your questions. If you have anything that you'd like to ask, go ahead and type it into the questions panel, and Drew will answer as many as he can in the time provided. So, Drew, you mentioned early on that Vermont during this time was kind of a frontier area, very much a frontier area. And uh, Vicki asks, so was land more available in Vermont than Massachusetts, especially after the Revolutionary War? Um, and was land rewarded to, to soldiers? So in answer to the first part, yes, there was more land available there because it was literally a frontier. 
very few people had settled before the Revolutionary War. You have a handful in the early 1760s. It stops for the French and Indian War, and then it doesn't get going in earnest again until right at the end of the Revolutionary War. Were soldiers given land for their service? Yes. It wasn't in the same manner that you see some Revolutionary War settlers getting it in the old Northwest territories, Ohio and those lands, but there are Northern Vermont, uh, there are towns that were chartered for Vermont soldiers for their service. So it's yes to both. All right, thank you. Now, a few people are asking about um, submitting or contributing to the study project. Is that something that you um, allow or encourage? And how would someone go about uh, submitting a sketch to the study project? So we do allow people to submit material. Initially, we were letting them submit material for the entire project, but that became problematic because we weren't going to be covering certain areas or certain time periods for quite some time. So now what are we, we are looking at just for those who settled up to 1771, and those can be sent in, and we can give you the uh, email in a moment. It's on another slide, I believe. And that, uh, what we would ask you to submit is your sketch, the bare bones stuff, meaning the vital records, identify the person you think was there, and then also uh, a list of their kids and who they married, if you have that. That's what we're looking for, along with one primary record that actually gives their residence in Vermont, and it has to be for 1771 or before. Now, that's one reason why we have the 1771 census up at the moment. So anybody who's in that census qualifies for this project but realize that that only covers the eastern half of Vermont. So if you were to have an ancestor in western Vermont, say early Bennington or any of the other towns there, you would still need to provide something that locates them there by 1771, but we give no guarantee that we're going to get to it right away because we're trying to do this geographically. When we do it geographically, we find that we have better uh, methods of getting a clearer picture of who somebody was and where they came from. So though we welcome it, we won't pick it up until we get to that town geographically. And we're thinking that to cover all of the towns up to 1771 is going to take about 12 years. We are in year four of this project right now. So that gives you an idea of why we may not be taking anybody beyond 1772 to 1784 because we want to do it in a timely manner and that's not fair to you to have you waiting for that long. So those 1771 and before we welcome and we will get to them when we get to that town. Thank you. Now a lot of people are asking about the historic maps that you showed. Um, fantastic beautiful maps. Do you have kind of a resource or or maybe a repository that you suggest uh, people look at for historic maps of Vermont? Yes, um, there are many places you can go online. If you Google Vermont historic maps, you get a whole bunch of websites. But for me, the one that I like the best is the Leventhal Collection at Boston Public Library. So Boston Public Library is bpl.org, and I'm looking to see, yeah, they don't have the, the maps directly on the front page. So um, it's the Leventhal Collection of Maps, and once you get a link to that, or if you put Leventhal Boston Public Library, you'll get the link to it. But uh, that is where I get most of my maps. They are free to use. Um, so that is a good point, a good place. 
to go. Yeah, that's the uh, the Norman B. Leventhal Map Center, and um, a fantastic resource. We use it a lot here at NEHGS, and um, they have high-res images. You can zoom in and out uh, right on the browser, and you can also download high-res uh, images or copies of the, of the maps as well, so that's a, a fantastic resource. Um, George, I can give you the URL for people. Okay. It is collections dot Leventhal map dot org Leventhal is L E V E N T H A L so it's collections dot Leventhal map dot org and if you didn't catch that I can also include it in my follow-up email to everyone after today's broadcast so you should be able to um, easily get that uh, that link in just a moment um, now, you know, you talked a lot about the, the jurisdiction issues in Vermont. Um, we have one question. Do you kind of go into detail about those changing boundaries um, in, in any of the published books yet, or the, the volume that we have published? So the question is whether we go into the jurisdiction changes. No, we do not. What we're doing right now is just doing settlers, and these settlers cross many jurisdiction uh, changes at the time. So if I was to include a discussion about that, it would literally, literally be in every sketch. What we hope to do is to uh, create some articles in American Ancestors. I have been asked by the editor there to occasionally create uh, articles explaining more detail about the project, and that's one of the ones that we will cover there. And just some clarification on, you know, those those changing boundaries. So where would you find the records for an area, you know, you talked about um, the county that was Cumberland County, that's now Wyndham, uh, and I think Windsor, I may be wrong there, but, you know, so would those records from this time period, would they be held in Vermont? Would they be held at a town level? Would they be held by New York? Um, where, how do you kind of go about finding the location of these original records when the boundaries were shifting so often? Okay, so I can give you an example there. My hometown, which is Springfield, Vermont. So let's start with that. Initially, that was a New Hampshire grant town in 1761. The grant is from New Hampshire, so that is where you find the grant. You will also find some of the earliest trading of land before the town is established. So you have a charter date, which is 1761, and then you have when people start moving in there, which is when the town is, quote, organized, when they start holding their own meetings in the, in the town itself. And so the earliest deeds that are usually among proprietors would be in the New Hampshire records, which at that time there were no counties in New Hampshire, so it's at Exeter. And those records are in the Rockingham County deeds, and that's where you find the earliest ones. So Vermont is a place where you record things on the town level. So many of those deeds do get re-recorded or recorded for the first time many years after the fact in the town deeds. When it was part of New York from 1764 to 1777, it was in Cumberland County, New York. So depending on your, your political uh, persuasion, you might actually record it in the New York records. They do it on a county level. So there are Cumberland County deeds. I have found the originals. They were actually in the courthouse in Newfane, Vermont, and I published all of them in Vermont genealogy, and they are there. The originals uh, would have been in uh, Chester because that was the capital of the county at the time, but they've made their way down to Newfane, and so the originals are there if you want to see them. Transcriptions are 
in Vermont genealogy. All right, now we have a number of questions about when are you going to get to a specific county? When are you going to get to, you know, Bennington or Addison or, um, you know, other counties? How, oh. how, how do you suggest, you know, is there, um, and I know you kind of talked a little bit about um, how you're approaching the research and kind of um, going in a geographical order um, and arranging your research in that way. But is there any way for people to know kind of what's coming up or what's uh, soon to be tackled? Uh, yes, there is. So I started with my hometown, Springfield, Vermont, as I mentioned before. And I did that for several reasons. One is I know the records more than any other town there. And this was the start of the project. And we wanted to see how this was going to go. So I started there. And also because there's a comprehensive early history in uh, Abby Hemingway's volumes called Vermont Historical Gazetteer. Every county was covered except for Windsor County. So feeling for my home county, I started with that first. That being said, we've done we've just finished or just am finishing Windsor County. That is Cumberland County, New York for the time period that, that we're dealing with. So to keep staying with the same class of records because I know them well, we're going to continue with the rest of Cumberland County. That happens to be Wyndham County, the county to the south. We have already started with sketches in Rockingham, the first town south of Springfield and will continue till we go down to the Massachusetts border thereby finishing that county. The next place we're going to go is north of all of that on the eastern side and the reason being is remember we were using the 1771 census as a guide. So the northeast corner of or quadrant of Vermont is even more rural and that census is even more important. It survives for the north east quadrant so that's why we're going there next. That will finish the whole eastern side of Vermont. Then we will start down at the bottom where it's one of the older sections in Bennington County and then just work our way up in Bennington County from Bennington County south, north, and then going into Rutland, south, north, and then the northwestern quadrant. What we're anticipating for volumes is the four southern counties, which are Windsor, Wyndham, Bennington, and Rutland. Each one of those are probably going to take two published volumes to cover everybody there. The northeast quadrant will be one volume, and the northwest quadrant will be another volume for a total of 10 volumes altogether. And any estimate how long you think this will will take? Well, originally we were saying about 12 years we think it's going to have to, to complete all of that. It might go as late as 14 years. It depends how fast it goes and how well I do with that. But uh, hopefully in another 10 years, roughly, we will have the whole thing done up to 1771 and then we'll start again with uh, Vermont all over again for 1772 to 1784 and by then of course we'll also have the cards up from Don Smith. Great um, and a few people are asking you know do, do you have to be a member to access uh, the uh, the database that we that we talked about today you do you do have to be a current member of NEHGS a subscribing member to access um, the database of the early Vermont settlers as well as the um, the 1771 uh, census for Cumberland County which we just posted actually I believe that went up just a few days ago so it's that's a brand new uh, searchable database on our website Drew did you want to yeah. add anything there. Yes, so that went up. It went initially as a membership only, only, but is supposed to be 
opened up for a free database. So if you have a guest user, you can look at that database. And that's because we want people for two reasons. We want people to see what the project is going to cover so they can see that. And also because um, the original records that are being posted there are from the Vermont State Archives. And Vermont State Archives uh, founding principle is that all records are public records and are open to everybody. So any HGS is going to make that an open database. Fantastic. So yes, that 1771 census will be made available to all guest users. The sketches of the early uh, settlers of Vermont will still be behind. Um, well, you will have to be a member to access those. All right, so um, thank you all for attending. Uh, once again, if you'd like hands-on help with your research, you may want to consider scheduling a consultation with one of our experts or hiring our research services team. If you're interested in learning more about those services, you can write to the email addresses on the current slide. I'll also include that information in my follow-up email to you, which you should receive in uh, shortly. And I will also include a, uh, an email address for more information. So if you wanted to write to Drew to learn more about the study project or uh, to learn more about submitting a sketch for the project, um, I will also include that in my follow-up email. So thank you again for joining us today. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. And if you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center, AmericanAncestors.org education. I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.